There's an old movie from 1905 by the name of The Thieving Hand, in which an armless beggar is given a prosthetic arm. As it soon turns out, the prosthetic arm has a will of its own, and begins pickpocketing people. When he is put in jail, the prosthetic arm discovers its original owner, a thief, and returns to him. This is perhaps the earliest movie to tackle the relation between memory, the body, and identity, and the conflict is resolved in a very traditional way. The arm, with its memories of pickpocketing, returns to its original, hence authentic, hence rightful, owner. Identity is restored, and the conflict is resolved. The idea presented by this movie seems to be that there is a natural essential affinity between one's body, one's memories, and one's identity. In the mid-90s, Alison Landsberg, a theorist whose work has been influential in memory studies, counterposed the plot of The Thieving Hand to that of Total Recall, a 90s sci-fi action flick based on a story by Philip K. Dick, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, which likewise centers on the relation between memory and identity. But one could argue that, whereas The Thieving Hand was a product of modernity, Total Recall is a product of postmodernity, and its treatment of its themes reflects that. In Total Recall, not only are memories transferable, they are no longer viewed as rightfully belonging to an original, authentic owner. When it comes to memory and identity, the very notion of authenticity becomes insignificant. What this movie is about, according to Alice and Landsberg, is the creation of artificial memories. Memories that are not derived from lived experience. What she calls prosthetic memories. Now, in a way, memory has always been prosthetic, in the sense of being supplemented and technologically mediated. Our memories are never perfect, they of necessity must exclude some things while emphasizing others, and throughout history they have been processed and adjusted through the stories we tell one another, rituals, writings, art, and various forms of media. I remember, for instance, the way that my childhood memories were shaped by the family photo albums I used to look at. The earliest childhood memory I can remember is a memory of me sitting on a wicker chair, and it just so happens that there is a photo of that moment. I have no idea if I would have retained that memory if it wasn't supplemented by the photo. And perhaps I only formed the memory in retrospect, after seeing the photo in later years. In that case, this memory I have would actually be derived from the technology of photography, rather than lived experience. Landsberg therefore concedes that memory has always involved certain supplements, but she singles out modern mass media like cinema as a special case, for two main reasons. First of all, when we watch an engaging movie, we are forming memories that are not based on direct lived experience, but are nevertheless emotionally charged and felt almost on a personal level the way traditional memories are. And secondly, because modern mass media is commodified, that is, made to be bought and sold on a market and widely distributed, it is no longer exclusive to particular cultural or ethnic groups, the way that many past forms of cultural memory were. To an increasing extent, the widespread distribution of popular mass media has made cultural memories more widely accessible, and therefore less exclusive to particular groups of people. And, Landsberg believes, this gives them a politically progressive potential. It is the memories created by such modern cultural products that she refers to as prosthetic memories, a concept which she first presented in an essay from 1995, back when every trendy writer of cultural theory spoke about sci-fi movies and cyberpunk, and she did this through an analysis of the movie's total recall as well as Blade Runner. In Total Recall, we follow a man named Quaid, played by Arnold Schwarzenegger, a regular but very muscular construction worker living a normal life on Earth, but having dreams and fantasies of visiting Mars. He ends up hearing about Recall, a company that sells memory implants, memories that are artificial yet feel real, and can provide you with experiences that would otherwise be inaccessible to you. This is thus a world in which even memories have become commodities not far from our own. With VR technology, the arrival of a company like Recall isn't unlikely. Quaid decides to pay for their services so as to receive memories of going to Mars, something much cheaper and less dangerous than a real trip to Mars. 
He dreams of doing something really significant and heroic, and so agrees to a memory program which would involve him going to Mars as a secret agent, saving the planet from an evil ruler and getting the girl. However, as the procedure begins, it turns out that Quaid's memory had already been tampered with in the past. He comes to realize that he really is a secret agent, learns that his current life is a lie, that his wife is an actress, and that his memories of the last eight years are artificial implants. He thus escapes to Mars while being chased by the so-called Agency, who work for Cohagen, the ruler of Mars. Mars is a site of violent class struggle, in which Cohagen rules over the population through monopoly control of the air supply, and the most oppressed section of the population, the mutants, are engaged in a liberation movement to wrest control of the air supply away from Cohagen. The very existence of these mutations is related to Cohagen's rule, as his regime cut corners while building the domes in which the mutants live, resulting in living spaces that were not sufficiently protected from radiation, and therefore caused various mutations. In the movie commentary, director Paul Verhoeven explicitly refers to the rebel mutants as guerrilla fighters, making the connection to real historical struggles quite clear. Quaid joins the movement on the side of the rebels, who know him from before as an agent of Cohagen who defected to their side. As the plot unfolds, however, Quaid learns of his true identity, or in any case, the identity of the original owner of his body, Hauser. Hauser was working for Cohagen in opposition to the rebels, and as part of a long-term strategy, agreed to be implanted with new memories and a new identity, that of Quaid so as to believe himself to be a rebel, genuinely gain the rebels' trust, and thereby lead Cohagen's forces to the leader of the rebellion. Meaning that all this time, Quaid was an unwitting double agent, working for Cohagen without even knowing it. Hauser's plan was thus to genuinely become the rebel Quaid, to lead Cohagen's forces to the rebel leader, and then to have his original identity, that of Hauser, returned to his body. You see, it's my body you've got there. Back. But it is at this point that the movie's themes of the relationship between memory, identity, and authenticity really come to the forefront, and the emerging problems are resolved in a very postmodern way. In a more traditional, romanticist narrative, the search for one's identity would usually involve getting past everything that is artificial so as to discover what is authentic, to bring the body back to its origin, to recover one's original memories. And yet, to Quaid, on Landsberg's reading, authenticity doesn't seem to be a relevant value at all, and he doesn't care about the fact that all of his current memories are artificial. It is the consequences of his memories that matter to him, not whether they are authentic. And he therefore chooses to maintain his artificial but more rebellious identity over his authentic original identity. Making a moral choice, he chooses the personality of Quaid, an artificially constructed one, over Hauser, a personality that had been based on directly lived experiences. This is what makes Total Recall's stance on identity postmodern. It rejects the ethical criteria of originality and authenticity, and this is why Landsberg highlights it. Hence, earlier in the movie, when Quaid meets the leader of the rebels, a mutant by the name of Quato, he says that he wants to remember. Be myself again. You are what you do. A man is defined by his action, not his memory. Landsberg interprets this as meaning that the way your memories lead you to act is more important than whether they are authentic or artificial. She sees this plot twist as a metaphor for the way in which prosthetic memories, such as those created in us by certain movies, TV shows, or experiential museums and historical reenactments, are not necessarily bad and undesirable, but can actually lead to a more empathetic existence. It is, after all, precisely by adopting an artificial identity that Quaid is able to aid the mutants in their liberation movement. Landsberg thereby ethically embraces an aspect of the postmodern, which is commonly criticized and denounced as one of postmodernity's negative characteristics, the loss of authenticity. 
Her hope then is that mass media technologies can provide us with prosthetic memories that, although artificial, allow us to understand experiences that are by nature not our own, and therefore make us more empathetic towards people who are different from us. If technology allows cultural memories to circulate, they can then be shared, and sees being exclusionary. She argues that, ultimately, such technologies could contribute to a politics based on empathy, rather than sympathy, as she argues that while sympathy is based on embracing what is similar between you and another person, empathy is about embracing differences. And so she writes, I would like to suggest that what we have embarked upon in the postmodern is a new relationship to experience, which relies less on categories like the authentic and sympathy than on categories like responsibility and empathy. Politically, Total Recall is generally left-leaning, as it showcases the way political rulers leverage their control over natural resources so as to maintain power and oppress the population, and the film clearly takes the side of the guerrilla fighters who are waging an armed struggle to make a natural resource accessible to all. There is, however, a clear criticism to be made of its politics. At the end of the film, liberation is not ultimately won by the autonomous collective action of the mutants themselves, those who suffer most from Kohagen's rule, but by someone who is an outsider to the struggle, a non-mutant, who wins liberation for the mutants, rather than side by side with them, and does so as an individual, rather than as part of a wider social movement. This is the kind of reduction of politics to individual choice that I talked about in my video on Margaret Thatcher, and it has a clear relation to the movie's themes of memory. Although shared collective cultural memories exist, memories are often experienced individually, and can even be almost solipsistic. In fact, a study called The Presence of the Past concluded that while African Americans and Native Americans are more likely to share collective cultural memories, such as those of slavery, the civil rights movement, or the violation of Indian treaties, white Americans are much more likely to relate to past history in more individualized terms, such as family life. This brings us to the elephant in the room when it comes to Landsberg's analysis of Total Recall that fans of the movie were probably already thinking of, an interpretation of the movie that Landsberg does not mention. That is, the possibility that the entirety of the events on Mars, including the liberation of the mutants, is not really happening, but is simply another artificial memory implanted in Quaid by Recall. On this reading, the fact that the liberation struggle is then won by a non-mutant earthling acting as an individual makes a lot of sense. It is not the depiction of a real liberation movement, but a narrative constructed by the corporation so as to appeal to Quaid's ego, producing in him the pleasant memory of being a hero. On this reading, the memory program sold to him is not unlike many first-person shooter video games in which the player is given a power fantasy in which they single-handedly save the world. Whether this is the case in Total Recall or not is made deliberately ambiguous, but there are elements that suggest this reading. For instance, director Paul Verhoeven said that they chose to have the movie fade to white at the very end so as to suggest that Quaid, stuck in an artificial memory, is being lobotomized in the real world. This is the aspect of the movie that more pessimistic critics of postmodernity might zero in on. The lack of certainty, the inability to distinguish between the real and the false, and the transformation of a political liberation movement into an artificial memory to be bought and sold. So, Total Recall can either be read as the story of liberation achieved by embracing one's artificial memories, or the story of a man's mind being destroyed by the commodification of memories. This ambiguity, this double aspect, reflects the double aspect of commodification as such. On the one hand, global markets can be seen as liberating culture from old, narrow-minded traditions and constraints, as products of any given place and culture can now be consumed by people from other places and cultures. It thus makes culture more universal and accessible. This is what Alison Landsberg places her hopes in. On the other hand, commodification also increasingly reduces all human motivation to the profit motive, and risks making culture into something trivial or degraded, something that exists only to be sold. If we gift them the past, 
We create a cushion or a pillow for their emotions, and consequently, we can control them better. Memories. You're talking about memories. Blade Runner, which happens to be loosely based on a story by Philip K. Dick as well, is also used by Alison Landsberg to explore the topic of prosthetic memories. As one of the movie's central characters, Rachel is a replicant, that is, a humanoid cyborg, who has been implanted with false memories so as to believe herself to be human. Memory here, again, is presented as being constitutive of one's identity, even if it is artificial. Landsberg singles out one scene in particular. I didn't know if I could play. I remember lessons. I don't know if it's me or Terrell's niece. You play beautifully. In other words, whether Rachel's memories are artificial or not, they, in effect, allow her to play beautifully. But like Total Recall, although it is read in an optimistic light by Alison Landsberg, Blade Runner contains a very distinct dystopian aspect, and has often been read as such. David Harvey, for instance, reads the world of Blade Runner as being a postmodern dystopia where, quote, the chaos of signs, of competing significations and messages, suggests a condition of fragmentation and uncertainty at street level that emphasizes many facets of postmodern aesthetics. And he reads the replicant's lack of genuine memory as being exemplary of our own lack of historical awareness living in a postmodern world. Rachel tries to prove the reality of her memories by showing a photograph of herself with her mother, something which, of course, can easily be edited and manufactured. And so David Harvey comments that, quote, history for everyone has become reduced to the evidence of the photograph. And although her memories do allow Rachel to play beautifully, they were implanted in her by the Tyrell Corporation, who ultimately created her as a product, a commodity. Commerce is our goal here at Tyrell. More human than human is our motto. The corporation's building is a gigantic pyramid that, both figuratively and literally, towers over the city, and is itself postmodern in its architecture. Once again, we see here the double aspect of commodification. While prosthetic memories do open up new possibilities, they depend upon a commodification that places us at the mercy of corporate power. Landsberg's essay is an example of an anti-romanticism that became trendy in the late 20th century, a trend that I discuss in my video on cyberpunk. Whereas romanticism tended to focus on values like originality, nature, and authenticity, postmodern theory criticized or tried to move past such values, instead embracing the unnatural, the artificial, and the technological. Where romanticists saw only alienation, the cyber-postmodernists saw a potential for liberation. And one of the things that make Total Recall special is that it can be read as supporting either one of these conflicting positions. Landsberg, of course, does not deny that the commodification of memories can be harmful or used in insidious ways. The argument she strictly rejects is that prosthetic memories are by their very nature inherently harmful. Instead, she holds out a hope that their mass appeal and ability to cross cultural boundaries opens up the possibility of a better world. The reason Total Recall has this double aspect is because our very world contains this double aspect. A double movement, which on the one hand creates the conditions for cultural understanding and cooperation, and on the other hand creates the conditions for total corporate domination. Whether we should be optimistic or pessimistic is a question of which of these two aspects will win out, and that is ultimately up to us. And now I'd like to thank the prosthetic identities that support me on Patreon. Apply Quine that doesn't work on 37th Call, 404 Error, Just Undo It, A B, A Sociology of Tarot, Alien Hernandez, Andre Oliva, Archive Transients, Bacchus, Celsius Enjoyer, Christopher, Clam Tears, Colin Pauli, Daniel Zotner, Don Nolis, Dern Sid, Evie Ross, Eric Owens, Gub Gub Kol Kol, Harbin Motts, Hong Kong Aesthetics, Ian Wenzel, Jonah Shi, John Di Pagani, Jones Indiana, Carl New, Kotochny, 
Katy Perry is John Bennett Ramsey, Logan O, M. Lim, Matthew Richards, Max Bendick, Nathaniel Lark, Nymfarco Nectarine, Paul Winfer, Paul Cat, POV You Are Naked and Held Down by Lacan's The Real, Rachel Ann, Radical Q, Robert Seals, Slevin Oliveres, Spiritfarer, Tendies123, The Empty Set, Venice, Victor Redko, Ver, Yavin Arba, Zim, as well as all of these wonderful patrons. If you're wondering where part three of the German Revolution is, don't worry, it'll come eventually. My patrons wanted me to take a break from the German Revolution so as to do a video on a different topic. And if you support me on Patreon for any amount, you can vote in polls like that as well. You'll also have access to supplementary notes that I write for my videos and a Google Drive with relevant reading material. For anyone who's wondering, I'll also soon be releasing my yearly video of the top 10 books I read last year. I'll see you then. Hope you've had a good first month of the year. Thank you.